Hi, welcome back to Grains and Small Places, and today we're going to be doing something kind of fun. A lot of you have been asking me for a sourdough sandwich bread, so I'm delivering that to you today. So let's get started. So today we're going to be using our friend Bubbles. <laughs> it's my sourdough starter's name, and we're going to be using all sourdough for this recipe. Now, if you are not into sourdough yet, that's fine. Keep watching because there's still a lot of good tips and tricks, and you can make this recipe with yeast as well. But regardless, we're going to be using sourdough starter. So this is a complete sourdough sandwich bread as opposed to a yeast sandwich bread where you can just add a couple tablespoons of your starter in just for flavor. So there's a little bit of a difference there, but you can make both kinds. So you want to make sure you give your sourdough starter a nice good feeding the night before you want to make this recipe or any recipe really, and you want to make sure that you're going to feed it with a similar flour to what the recipe calls for. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and feed with hard white wheat because the majority of the recipe calls for hard white wheat. I like to mark my jar so that I know when my bubbles doubles. <laughs> it's the next morning and you can see that my sourdough starter has doubled so I know it's nice and active. Okay, so to start out for our sourdough sandwich bread, I'm going to weigh out the wheat berries and that will give me the exact weight in flour once it's done being milled. And I'm going to be using mostly hard white. You can sub hard red if that's all you have. And I'm going to be using a little bit of kamut. Now, if you don't have kamut, I recommend you giving it a try sometime when you can. But if you don't have kamut, you can go ahead and use all of your hard white or all hard red, or you can sub in potentially a little bit of spelt instead of the kamut, or you can do all hard white with a little bit of hard red. So we're gonna start out, we need a total of 560 grams of wheat berries. So what I'm going to do is use about 450 grams of hard white wheat berries. And I love these little containers. I can, you know, keep an eye on the volume of how much I have left. They snap on great, nice and airtight. They come with these little scoops and these little stickers for labels. I can link them in the description box below if you're interested in them. But then I'm gonna get 110 grams of kamut. And I just love what this does for my breads. You'll see in many of my recipes that I end up putting kamut in a lot of them. It just gives it a nice buttery flavor. It has a beautiful golden hue and I really love how it helps with the gluten development. I just really like to add a little bit of this into a lot of my bakes. Okay, so that's the kamut. So 560 grams wheat berries and we're going to take it over to our mill and go ahead and mill it into our fresh milk flour. I'm using my Nutramil Harvest Grain Mill and I have a coupon code for you for $20 off your grain mill or any Nutramil mixer. Bosch mixer or anything on their website. The coupon code is grainy if you're interested in grabbing that discount. And while we're milling our flour, we can go ahead and measure out our water. We're going to use 360 grams of water. And for this recipe, it calls for three tablespoons of butter. I'm going to go ahead, mine is very cold, so I'm going to pop it in here and then I'm going to put this in the microwave. Um, in the recipe, I generally call for room temperature butter when you're making it with sourdough just because you want to make sure that you do not put anything in here that's going to be too hot for your sourdough because if you put in hot water or you heat this too hot, it will kill your sourdough starter and you will not have a rise. Same way as if the water's too hot, you can kill the yeast. So you wanna make sure that this is under like at least, I would say I would say to keep it under 110 degrees Fahrenheit or less, but it probably would survive if it was slightly warmer than that. If you don't wanna use butter, you can always use olive oil or avocado oil here as well. Okay, so we're not too hot, just warm enough that I can melt the butter. It doesn't have to be completely melted in here, but I want it to be at least softened mostly. I 
And then what I'm going to do is go ahead and put my egg in here as well. That way I have all my liquid ingredients ready to go into the mixer. And we will put the dry ingredients and the salt and the sugar in our mixer later. So I'm going to just do one large egg right in there. And I'm going to mix that around, make sure that that egg is all broken up and combined and incorporated. And then I will grab our mixer and you can see now that the butter is almost all the way melted. And the other reason we don't want our water to be hot is because if I crack the egg in here, we obviously don't want that egg to cook. So, okay, I'm going to set this to the side. Our flour is done milling. So we are ready to go with that. I'm going to go ahead and grab our mixer and we will get started on putting the dough together. And today we're going to be using my Anchor Stone Mixer. So mixing times will vary for you, so I really recommend that you pay attention to the dough rather than the time that it takes to knead because every time I make bread, the kneading time varies. I will tell you that I have kneaded from anywhere from five to eight minutes with success but there's other times I've had to knead for 30 minutes and that may be the same recipe with the same wheat berries that I'm always using. It's just always different. I don't know. It must, it just has to do with the weather. It has to do with humidity, elevation, just everything. Now I do travel. So that does also change my results often for me, but I think that's also what helps me learn every time I make it and help me be able to answer people's questions that are in different climates than mine. I'm remembering to plug it in this time. <laughs> before I start. All right, we're going to use the dough scraper and the dough roller. You could use the dough hook if you want. If you don't have this mixer, again, it, some of these things won't apply to you, but the dough itself will apply to you. So let me see if I can adjust this. That's too close. Okay, hopefully that's better. I spent an unrealistic amount of time trying to adjust that. <laughs> okay, so in goes our water, butter, and egg. I'm going to use three tablespoons. This is raw organic cane sugar. You could use honey, maple syrup, or whatever sweetener you prefer. I think that was three. Sometimes when I'm talking, I lose track of what I'm measuring. So, <laughs> okay, one and a half teaspoons of salt. I like to use sea salt. If you are someone that uses the Redmond's Real Salt, I will give you a little tip here. If you've had any issues with your bread being grainy, there are reports that it just doesn't dissolve all the way in baking. So with the Redmond's Real Salt, which I have some here, I love, I love to use it for my cooking and all of those things. But when I put it in my bread, I find that oftentimes I get some grit in there. So if that doesn't bother you, by all means, go ahead and continue to use it. But if you're noticing that it's gritty, I find a lot of people want to blame that on the wheat berries, but in fact, it's actually probably your salt. So I like to stick with the sea salt for my bakes, even though I definitely love the Redmond Real Salt. I'm not saying that not to use it. I definitely love it, but it can cause some grit in your bread. Okay, so what we're going to do is go ahead and turn this on. And I'll just let this mix a little bit and then we'll put in our flour. So here is the alternative version if you wanna use just water, oil, like olive oil and honey rather than butter and sugar and milk. Either way will work. Okay, so to this, I'm gonna add my flour and then we'll add in the sourdough starter. And so I know that's a little different what I normally say is to add the yeast in later, but the sourdough takes a lot longer. So we're going to go ahead and add it in at this point in time. But we'll add in our flour first. Your flour amounts may vary slightly. So as I said, it's always a little bit different depending on the climate that you're in, the humidity that you're in, even the moisture in the wheat berries themselves varies for everybody. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this just kind of nice and mixed and incorporated in before we add in our sourdough starter. Okay, that's looking pretty good. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab bubbles. So here is bubbles and you can see, I hope you can see this because 
I have a mark here where we marked where we fed him last night. And then you can see right here, all this residue on the side of the jar. That means he rose and he's already on his way back down. So that means he ate to his fullest and he's going back down. And when he comes back down here, that means he's hungry and be ready to be fed. So we're going to use about a half a cup of this. I generally don't weigh this part. So let me see if I can just move that up a minute. But I want to weigh it out so that I can make it right for you guys. <laughs> okay, so... Everybody's sourdough will weigh a little bit differently. So you can see the beautiful air bubbles in here. So some will be airier, some will be less airy. And as you know, air doesn't really weigh anything. So if yours is really bubbly, a half a cup of your starter might be more or less weight than someone else's. But I find that this one is pretty forgiving. See, look how beautiful that is. So maybe we're looking more at like 115 grams. Obviously I don't want to use up all of bubbles, but if you can see, I only have just a little bit left in my jar here. That's fine. I've used this for feeding all the time. You can feed heavily. I like to feed, like I'll say, I'll tell people to do, you know, the same amount of flour, same amount of water, same amount of starter. And that's a great thing to do when you're just getting started. But when you want to make this stronger, a lot of times it's, it's good to feed double. So what I mean by that is you'll take 25 grams of the starter and add 50 grams of flour and 50 grams of water. And then he's being fed double essentially, which makes him a little bit stronger. So that's what I'll do since I only have this little bit left here. So I'm going to set him to the side. Okay. So this is going in about a half a cup or so. This was 115 grams. If you use less sourdough starter, it will take longer to rise. If you use more sourdough starter, it will take less time to rise. Also, if your water is warm, it will rise quicker as long as it's not too hot. Then it won't rise at all because remember I said that will kill it. Um, if the water is cold and you want to say you have plans and you want this to take a slower rise, you can use less starter and cooler water and that will make the rise time slower. So there's not really a good way. I've been kind of hesitating on putting this video together for this bread because there's not really a set time to tell you for the kneading, for the rising, for any, for any of those things. You just have to watch the dough and have it tell you what to do because if you overproof it or underproof it, there could be an issue. So that's one of the reasons I've just been a little bit hesitant on putting this out because in my recipe of the written recipe, I can't really put an exact time for you because everyone's will be different. So we're going to go ahead and mix this in. If you have this mixer and you're mixing this together and this is rising up in the bowl or anything, this needs to be pulled away from the edge. And when you pull it from away from the edge, it still will be able to pull to the center but it can't go out anymore. So don't think this is broken because this moves while you're kneading. That's perfectly normal for this mixer. So I'm just gonna pull this in and make sure that all of this is incorporated. Turn it up a bit. And this already smells like beautiful sourdough. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is the same thing I do when I'm making my yeast bread. I'm gonna go ahead and let this sit for at least 15 minutes so that the bran can soften, the fresh milled flour can start absorbing that liquid because it takes a lot longer for fresh milled flour to absorb the liquid. So we wanna definitely give it a chance to soften because if it doesn't have a chance to soften, then it's not going to knead as easily because the bran is gonna to wanna to keep cutting through the gluten that we're trying to develop. So it kind of works against us if we skip this step. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this sit covered for about 15 minutes. You can let it sit a little bit longer if you want, but now we have sourdough in here, so we don't wanna let it sit too long because it will start fermenting and breaking it down too much to where we won't have any structure. So I would say somewhere between 15 minutes and an hour would be perfectly fine. I'm gonna go ahead and set a timer. Alexa, set a timer for 15 minutes. 
and we'll be back. Okay, it's been 15 minutes, and I'm gonna go ahead and start kneading. I'm gonna just set this away from the edge a little bit. So this kneading time will vary for you, but you can see we've already got a beautiful stretch. So it may only take five minutes or so. I'm gonna go ahead and set my timer for five minutes on my mixer, and then we will come back and check and see what the dough looks like. So we want this to be wet and going around our mixer like this. We don't want this to be in a solid ball going around at the very beginning because that means our dough is too dry. I know with traditional white flour, you're looking to put flour in until it forms a ball and pulls away from the edges, but we can't think like that with fresh milk flour. So now it's been five minutes. It's not quite ready. I can see it's definitely still too loose. Um, if I pick it up, it does have some stretch, but it's definitely very loose. So I'm going to go ahead and let this continue to go. Maybe I'm going to do maybe another, I'll do five minutes, but I'm going to check on it to make sure that we're where we want to be. But we want to make sure that this is pretty wet in the beginning. And then as it kneads and as it absorbs the liquid more and more and more, it becomes a little more dry and it, it all comes together. So if you try to resist adding flour and trust the process, you will see it transform in, in your eyes. And I love when I get the messages from people to me saying, thank you so much. I finally, finally got that nice squishy bread and it's because they trust just trust the wet of the dough and keep going with it. Obviously you don't want to over knead it because that can be an issue as well. So you want to keep checking on it, checking the texture of the dough. When it has a nice stretch to it and it wants to stay together, that's when you, where you're at, where you want to be. If you're pulling it and it's just tearing, then it's not there yet or you've already passed it. So make sure that in the beginning you're checking on it multiple times to make sure that you know what the dough's looking like, and once you understand what it looks like, you can set it, walk away, and forget it. But when you're learning, it's nice to just keep checking on it, and checking, just pulling on it, and seeing where you're at with that structure. So I'm gonna wash this up and let this continue. You can see it's starting to want to ball up and starting to want to stay together, so I know that I need to stand here close by and watch. So we're at about 10 minutes of kneading, but you can see that it's really wanting to form that ball on its own without adding any more flour or anything. And you saw how wet it was at the beginning. Okay, so now it's been 10 minutes. I'm gonna wet my fingers. By looking at it, I don't think we're there yet, but so you can see it's still breaking, but it's definitely holding together much better than it was. So I'm going to go ahead and let it go a little bit longer. Maybe again, I'll check five minutes. I, the amount of time for kneading always changes for me. So I always like to just keep checking on it. Occasionally I'm going to go ahead and let it go a little longer, but you can see it's already wanting to stay together more than it was before. So if you have this kneading action where the dough is going around the dough hook like this, you'll see it'll grab this stuff in the middle in a little bit. But if you have this kneading action, then you're actually kneading more because you're kneading surface area on the inside, surface area on the outside against the bowl, and you're ha actually having some going on here as well. So this is how you're gonna get the most beneficial kneading with this particular machine. So if you wanted to, you could move, roll, rock this in and pull this up, or over time, it eventually will grab it. There we go. See, you can see where that grabs it in, and then it, it will just keep doing that, and we're kneading from several areas of the dough, so this is perfect with this mixer.
You can see on the back edge here, it's starting to even want to come away before it gets to the scraper, whereas before it was always smushed to it. So I know we're super close here. It's getting smooth. I'm gonna go ahead and wet my hands. Anytime you want to touch the dough to check it, it's nice to have your hands wet. That way um, you know when you're touching it. Or that way your hands won't stick too badly. You can see how this is it's really wanting to stick together as it's going around here. Okay, so let's check this. This is super soft dough. So when I pull and stretch on it, it wants, it's hard for you to see that angle. When I pull and stretch on this, take a big hump, hunk of it, it wants to stay together. Yes, it might break a little bit, but we can also stretch this super thin. Okay, so what we're going to do is go ahead and let this rise. So this is where you're going to have to just pay attention to your dough and look for it to be about double or right before it doubles. So not quite all the way double. So this is a super soft dough and it's a super wet dough. As you can see, as I'm playing with it here, it, I know that you want me to add flour here. <laughs> I know you do, and I know you want to add flour. I understand. I used to be that way too. But if you want that in the light, soft sandwich bread, as you can see, when I lift this up, it all wants to stay together. So that light, soft, and fluffy sandwich bread, like the store-bought, you really do need a more of a wet dough. So if you want to add flour when I'm when you're kneading, you may not get the window pane, um, and that's fine. And if you like your bread like that, that's fine as well. There are times where I will make my bread dough a little bit drier just because I feel like something a little bit more dense or not so soft and squishy. So it really just depends on what bread you're in the mood for. So as I play with the dough here and just show you what it looks like, it's very, very wet, but it stays together. So that's what you want. If I lifted this up and it just came out in chunks, then that means it's either not kneaded enough or it got over kneaded. So what I'm going to do now is just go ahead and spray this with some oil. Even the stuff that gets stuck over there wants to stick. Okay, so I'm going to spray this with some oil and let this rise. Just so it doesn't stick any worse than it already is. And I'm going to check on this in probably an hour just to verify that it hasn't risen. Obviously that's probably too soon because with sandwich bread with yeast, it would be, I would be checking on it in an hour, but it's probably going to take closer to two. And if it's cold in your house, it may take, you know, three or four hours. It really just depends on your starter, how active it is. It depends on how warm it is. It depends on how warm the water was when you put it in and how much starter you use. So there's so many variables that take place that it's really hard to give you just a time that it's risen. So you really just wanna check and look for nice and puffy dough. If it's all dimply, if the dough is all dimply, then that probably means that it got overproofed. So you wanna make sure that you flatten it out and I guess you could always make focaccia with it. <laughs> Flatten it out and shape it. A lot of times, if it overproofs on that first rise, you can sometimes save it. If it overproofs on the second rise, it's pretty hard to save it. You can try to punch it down and reshape it. Um, and it'll give you decent bread, but it won't be as great as if it had risen perfectly and shaped it at the right time. So sourdough can be tricky and sourdough with fresh milk flour is a whole new animal. So <laughs> just learn 
as you go if you have a fail it's okay we all have fails and just keep doing it and you'll learn every time it happens so we'll come back to this um, after it's doubled in size and I'll let you know how long it, it took for me so while that is rising that is when I take my opportunity to go ahead and feed my sourdough starter for tomorrow or feed it and put it in the fridge or whatever you do with your sourdough so oftentimes I do this without a scale but I'm going to use the scale I just go by eye and see the thickness that I like it to be I used a lot of it for our bread so I really don't have a whole lot left here, but that's okay. Okay, so I have about 15 grams. So I'm going to go ahead and feed this double. So I'm going to give it 30 grams of water. And I like to just put my water in here and mix it around. That gets me the extra goodness leftover bits that I miss scraping it out. So then I should, you can zero this out or you can try to math. <laughs> so if I zero it out, I want th to add 30 grams. If I'm trying to math, then I'm going to leave it at that and then I will have 45 grams because I had the 15 and then the 30 so not trying to confuse you just to make it simple zero it out and then you use your 30 grams okay one thing make sure to never put your sourdough starter down the drain because it turns into concrete no matter how much water you rinse down the drain with it it coats your plumbing so it's really a good idea for discards to either use it in a recipe or throw it in the trash can so just don't put it down your sink I've seen too many horror stories of people having bad outcomes from that so I'm gonna go ahead and put in 30 grams of flour and I'm going to use hard white wheat really I use whatever I'm milling that day to feed my sourdough starter but if you're wanting to make sourdough bread then you're gonna want to use a hard wheat because that's what you're gonna be using for your recipe so whatever recipe I'm making I try to take into consideration my feeding before I make that recipe and try to make it out of the flour that I'm using for the recipe so that way the it's already used to eating that kind of flour so but I haven't had an issue with feeding it all kinds of different flowers and mixes of flowers. It eats it all, <laughs> especially when it's strong. So let me go ahead and zero this out. And I'm going to add 30 grams of fresh milled hard white wheat flour. Okay, 32, that'll work. And we're gonna mix that around. I like to start with somewhat of a thick sourdough starter because fresh milk flour ferments so much quicker than white flour. I like to feed extra and I like to feed it thick because otherwise you could feed this two to even three times a day because it ferments so much faster. So if you're using white flour with this recipe, it may not work out great for you with the times and all of that because it is different than fresh milled flour. Okay, so I'm just going to pop this in here. So this is only 75 grams of starters because we had the 30 plus the 30 plus the 15. So if you need this for a recipe, then you're going to need, and you need more than 75 grams of starter, you're gonna wanna make sure to feed this again before you start the next recipe. That way you'll have enough for discard, well, for feeding again for to continue his life rather than use all of him up in your recipe. You don't want to do that. So make sure you're not using 
bleached tap water that can kill your starter also make sure when you're covering this it's not an airtight cover so you can see here I'm using just a mason jar lid but I have my lid upside down so this lets enough air in here that he can still breathe but also keeps dust debris and any kind of bugs from getting into him so I'm gonna go ahead and just mark it I like to use these little dry erase markers and I just mark the side and then once he's risen and fallen, I need to feed him again. So if he sits on your counter, he's going to need fed at least once a day, sometimes twice a day, depending on how warm it is in your kitchen and how hungry your starter is. If you put him in the fridge, you wanna make sure that you get it out and feed it at least once a week. But once he goes in the fridge, it does become slightly different in flavor, slightly more sour maybe, but a different kind of sour. So. Sometimes well, I do keep mine in the fridge because I, I can't feed him every day. So I keep him in the fridge and what I'll do is I'll get him out of the refrigerator before I want to make a recipe and give him at least one to two heavy feedings before I start my next recipe with him. But if you're using this all the time and you're he's like sometimes he'll sit in my fridge for a month and I won't make anything with him. And then other times I'll get him out and I'll make multiple things, you know, every day. So it really just depends on what we're doing, where we're at and what what's going on in life these days. So he, I'm going to go ahead and put this one on my counter and that way I can feed him probably, he'll probably want fed tonight I'm guessing, but we'll keep an eye on it. So I'm going to go ahead and t grab two of my bread pans. Now I am using two four by eight bread pans because I have that small oven as you all know. Um, if you're using the larger five by nine pans, you may want to one and a half times this recipe, but I would still use only the same amount of sourdough starter. So one and a half times everything else. If you have those larger bread pans, but I'm going to line these with parchment paper. So this does a few things for me. It helps it not to stick. And then it also gives me nice handles to be able to pull this right out my whole loaf right out after it's baking. Cause I like to pull them out while they're still warm. And then I put them on the wire rack that way they don't get any wet condensation or anything like that in there. So let's go ahead and grab our dough. Okay, and it has been rising now. It has been almost exactly three hours. So as you can see, it's come up the side of my bowl quite a bit from before. I've got some bubbleage coming in through here. You can see coming up, so I don't want it to go too much further. Otherwise, I'll have an issue with it over, over proofing. So I'm gonna get some oil and put it on my counter here. I like to use olive oil or avocado oil, whatever you have available to you and I just like to do this so it doesn't stick and then I'll put a little on my pastry knife here bench scraper and even a little on my hands because like I said this is a wet sticky dough <laughs> okay I'm just gonna try to cons try to consolidate this into one Okay. All right, so I'm gonna just pull all this together, give it a little bit of strength back because it's very lax right now. But as you can see, the more I, tension I put on it, the firmer it is. Okay, so my hands are nice and oiled, my work surface is nice and oiled, and my bench scraper is nice and oiled. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this in half. best guess. And then shaping is a step that some people I think don't think is very important, but I find that it makes a nicer loaf. So I can feel all the air bubbles in this while I'm pressing on this. I'm just going to press it out into just a rough rectangle. And then we're just going to turn it into a small triangle on the tip and leave this kind of wonky back here. And you can see all these beautiful air bubbles in here, I hope. And I'm just going to pull this tip and then start rolling it in. Try to make sure there's no air trapped in here while you're doing this, but just kind of roll, pull it, pull it, pull it. And you can see this smooth, shiny 
tight surface. And then I just like to tuck the edges in here. Just kind of use my fingers and roll it under and then pinch it together. And then that's one loaf. And I hope you can see these air bubbles forming. So that may come out on the skin when I bake it, but I'm okay with that. I kind of like that for my sourdough sandwich bread. So let me go ahead and get the next one going. And at any time, if this starts to get too sticky to your fingers, you can always add a little bit more oil. So you can see what that gluten has done for us, the development of that, how I can stretch that without it wanting to tear. That is wonderful, exactly what we're looking for. So we're gonna go ahead and do the same thing. The big old air bubble there, I'm gonna pop it. Doesn't wanna pop. Okay, same thing, keeping it tight. Tight, rolling it. Roll that under, give it a pinch. I definitely, okay, we'll put that in there. I'm going to cover this with some parchment paper and let it rise and I'll let you know how long it takes to rise because this also varies on the heat in my house and all, all the variables. <laughs> so I'm going to guess probably one to two hours, but I will be back to let you know. Okay, it's been about two hours and they are almost to the top of my tray and they will, or the baking pan, and they will rise more as they bake. I'm going to go ahead and finish these off with a, just a simple egg wash. This has just about a teaspoon of water in it. And then I'm just going to put that over the top. You can choose to do this or not. This is an optional step, but it nice, makes it nice and shiny and browned. We're going to preheat our oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to bake these until the internal temperature is 205 to 210 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is a little bit warmer than what I bake my yeastos too because otherwise it's somewhat gummy and you want to make sure that you let the loaves cool all the way before cutting into them because that's another thing that can cause your loaves to be gummy i guess is the best word to describe it so those two things are generally some of the issues is either it's underbaked or it was cut into while the loaf was still warm as what can cause those there's some other things too but those are the most common Thanks so much for hanging out with me today while we made our sourdough sandwich loaf. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed what you saw and don't be afraid to just jump right in and get in the kitchen. Even if it doesn't turn out for you the first time, the second time, or the third time. We have all had fails. I can promise you that. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share with your friends, and check out my blog at grainsandsmallplaces.net where you can find this recipe and a whole bunch of other recipes all dedicated strictly to fresh milled flour. So thank you for stopping by Grains and Small Places. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.